and as people return to their places. As the pastor already, or if you don't know me, I'm Paul. And as the pastor already announced last week that I will be taking his place today. Now, if you expected Paul of Tarsus to be here today, <laughs> I have to disappoint you. It would be quite awesome if he would take this day. But uh, you have to do with me. Normally I'm here doing kids ministry, the seven to nine years old today. Then I'll do the 13 to 120 years old. And much easier audience because you listen. <laughs> and uh, just kidding. If you want to have a real blessed Sunday, then join Kids Ministry. Uh, you, it will be a time really well invested. Um, let me start my timer. I think I overprepared. Let Let me see that if I am able to go through all my notes. Otherwise, I tried to be merciful on you and cut it short. Uh, what a great message we, we had last week, so full of grace. And what a great way to end the book of uh, Revelation, finally. And I'm really looking forward to next week that we start in the, the book of First uh, Corinthians. Yeah. And I have a totally different topic, maybe not so full of grace, but very important things. And... Some years ago, when we were having with a bunch of brothers a Bible study, uh, one brother joined in who actually came to clean the church and, and going through our study, in the end he said, which always kept on ringing in my mind, the road is very narrow. And it's true, it's very narrow. So that will be my topic today. So I'll be sharing from Matthew 7, verses 13, uh, 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, when I was young, I had a picture on the wall of my bedroom and maybe better if you can put it up. Yeah, it looks like that. Uh, I, I think this is available also in English. This, is, this one is Dutch because I am from Holland. I am Dutch. It's a picture of the, the narrow road, the white or the narrow path, the right road, where they lead to. There's all Bible verses uh, printed all over it. Um, and... I always promised myself that one day I will take, take magnifying glasses and I will look what it actually says there. Well, I did it partially, but yeah. It gives a good picture of, of where we are going, the direction we are taking. And uh, this one actually was hanging in my grandmother's house. Well, how did it end up in my place? It's a long story, I will not tell it. But I can assure you, I didn't steal it. <laughs> yeah. So I had one myself, but unfortunately, my one year older brother, he draws some bicycles on it and things that <laughs> don't belong to it. So I don't have it anymore. Anyway, we do with this. So the first thing we read here is that the path is very narrow. You can call it a path, you can call it a road, you can pull it away. Different translations have different names for it. It is a spiritual way, so we cannot compare it to anything that we see. I like to think of it as a path, because paths are made by feet going over it, and roads are made by men. In Jesus' days, I think a road would have been pretty much like a path. And me and my wife, we always used to go Sunday hiking after church. We love it. We take some backpack with us with some lunch and grill some sausages or something like that somewhere in the forest. Just to get the calories back that you lose by doing it. <laughs> and um, I notice a lot of times the further you go, the narrower the path gets. In the beginning, when you take one of those nature trails, which there are like a zillion off here in Finland, in the beginning you will still find bridges over a little stream. When you go a few kilometers in it, you have to jump. And sometimes you don't even see the path at all, and sometimes you just go for a while on your sense of direction. 
you have to seek, you have to look, you have to watch your feet, or else you'll stumble. There's always the, the tree roots and rocks, stones, everything trying to pull you down. Anyway, <clears throat> the Nare part is a part that only few will find. Now, what, why is that? Matthew 22, 14 sheds a light on that. It says there, for many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus here is referring to anyone who hears the gospel. Each person must decide how they will respond to it. They either have to accept or reject it, the invitation. The Bible said that all of us are called or invited to follow Jesus. No one is excluded. We have a free will in this. God will never force anyone. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, God is faithful to whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> it is this calling that is the way to Christ, who himself is the narrow gate, and from where we start to follow this narrow path, full of grace. It is the place where we either accept him or reject him. You might be good Christian, you might be from a family of with good Christian parents. You might have gone through Bible college. You go to church every Sunday, you memorize the whole Bible. All of these things are very good for your benefits. But the things do not save you, only Jesus can. You need to make that choice. Many of us did already. Uh, some people might be going to church for years and years, and their hearts are still as far from God as any sinner. So let's look at this part today a bit more closely. It's a part full of blessings, and it's a part full of dangers. And first of all, I want to start with the narrow part. It's a part of persecution. John 15, 19 says, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. The narrow part is the part of suffering, hardship, trials, temptations. Acts 14.22 says, It is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. We should continuously prepare ourselves for this so we can deal with it, uh, with these things, and not lose hope or end up in despair, or worse, grow bitterness towards God and harden our hearts. Quoting Bible verses about suffering, persecution, trials, temptations should not be too hard as I believe that half of this book is filled with them. Uh, on Wednesday we are going to the book of Jeremiah before we, we stop for the summer, main, uh, summer break when it turned into Wednesday prayer meeting, we will continue again soon there, and, and Bob is handing out free handkerchiefs there to, to dry our tears, because it's such a sad book to, to read. Um, I don't remember exactly who said it uh, a while ago, I think I heard it here from the pulpit, but someone said, the proof of being filled with the Holy Spirit is trouble. And be encouraged by that. As first of all, it means that God takes notice of you, cares about you, and he's working in your life to refine you, to change your heart. First Peter 4, verse 12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as through some, some strange thing were happening to you. I remember many years ago being very surprised about a 
strange, fiery ordeal that came upon me. And I hated every second of it. And it made me angry. I woke up at night, I wasn't able to sleep. I was very ill prepared for any kind of suffering. And I believe today, I will not go through the whole story because it would take, the short version would take like three hours and we don't, <laughs> we don't have that. Or do you want to hear it? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I take no for answer. Yeah, so if I, I know for sure that if I would have been better prepared myself for this, I would have passed through this much easier and faster. Second Timothy 3, verse 12 said, Indeed, all who desire to have a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's a promise that the Bible gives us. Do you know a brother or a sister that has not suffered? I asked myself this about this question about two weeks ago. Personally, knowing someone going through a, a really hard situation right now, and I came to the conclusion that I hardly know any sister or brother that could not come up with a story that will bring tears to your eyes. I know few unbelievers whose life seemed to be like a walk in the park. And continuing here from verse 13, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of his glory, you may also rejoice and be overjoyed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and God rest upon you. Wow! The spirit of, glo of, of glory and God rests upon us. His Holy Spirit. Like we just said, proof of being filled in the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit is troubling your lives. Carry this verse in your heart with you everywhere you go and you just don't care anymore what anything might think or say about what you believe. In. Uh, I wish I could stand here today saying, believe in Jesus and you will never suffer. You will always get everything you ever wanted. Uh, you will be rich. Now just live your life, enjoy, and I'll see you in heaven. <laughs> That's worldly thinking. That is not the gospel that we are, are uh, uh, shared some people preach this. It's not the gospel of the Bible. James, he started the last chapter of his book. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. And he started the first chapter of his book. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. So for that reason, we can say that the narrow path, it's also the path of endurance. Matthew 24, 13 says, But the one who endures until the end, he will be saved. Endurance result of testing your faith through all kinds of hardships. I heard Bob said once, don't pray to get out of your trials. Pray that the trial serves its purposes in your walk with Christ. So prepare yourself for trials, for times of suffering, persecution, very important. So when those trials hit you, you will not be discouraged. Your faith does not save you from hard, hardships, but it will get you through them. In school, we are <clears throat> continuously tested and examined, right? If we pass the test, we proceed to the next level. If we fail, we do it all over again. Bob said it once, and I experienced it. It seems that if we fail, the Lord's pushed us again through the 
same trial until we pass through it so we can proceed. The narrow part is a part of battles. We are here at constant war. And again, we need to prepare, we need to eat the broccoli. It's healthy for you. Not only the lasagna and the other good stuff. We need to take the whole word of God. Not, not just those wonderful verses with blessings that we see passing by in our Bible apps, on the social media. Did you ever see a verse shared in, in, in Facebook? Timothy 3, 12, for instance. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You don't run into them very often. <clears throat> our food must be well balanced. We need both the blessings and the warnings. Ephesians 6, the armor of God, so important. There are many enemies we face. One goes round like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The same first starting with the warning, be of sober spirit, be on alert, don't sleep. <clears throat> There's one enemy in particular I wanted to point out today. In my eyes, the most dangerous. And if you're going to go to remember anything of what I share here today from the pulpit, I hope that you will remember this. Even Bob has pointed out this many times here, the flesh. And one of the greatest dangers to stagnate our progress. The flesh, the old man, he will tell you this, first of all, about repentance. You will do it later. About sin, he will say, you will do it just one more time and then you'll stop. I hope I would be the only one here present today suffering from these things. But I'm so afraid I'm not. And as Bob always humbly states, I know you don't suffer from this, but I do. <laughs> yeah, Bob, you are the only one. <laughs> so the flesh, so dangerous. You will do it later. Sin, you will do it just one more time and then you will stop. Yeah, right. It is the enemy from within, the old self, the flesh whispering in your ear. Your flesh don't want to have anything to do with the things of the spirits who want to change you. Your flesh will never change. Don't wait for that to happen. It won't. You carry it with you for as long as you're here on earth in your early tent. The battle that you can only win by yielding to the right one, the Holy Spirit, feeding on the word. Now is the time to act, not tomorrow. When the Spirit convicts you of certain things in your life, whether it's sin, whether it's just bad habits, when you sit on the teaching, when praying, when studying your Bible, or even a conversation with a brother or sister, and the Holy Spirit chooses that moment to show you something about yourself that's wrong in your heart still, convicts you of it, act upon it. Don't wait, don't leave it. Confess it as sin. Let the Lord clean you of it. And you know what? You most likely do the same thing again that you did. Again, you go on your knees, you confess, you do the same thing again. Ask for his blood to clean you. And what you will see is this. You will start to do it less often. You will start to try to resist. This is the true way of repentance. And after a while, you see, you will overcome it. But it takes time. Don't give up. You cannot ignore left sin in your life. 
you have to act upon it. Leave it like it is. It's the one way to quench the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Your flesh will always say, sure, we will do that. We will deal with it. But hey, now is the bad time. We'll do it tomorrow. We'll take care of it next week. Great. Well, I can tell you what will happen. You will not deal with it tomorrow. You'll forget about it and you'll just go on the way you were. This is such an extremely dangerous way of living. You will never make any progress. You'll just be running around in circles. Paul said something among like, I do what I do not want to do, and I do not what I want to do. I will not go there now. Don't have the time for it, but... James 4 verse 70 said, So for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. It's not only the sin for things that you do, it's also the things that you know you should do and you're not doing. And you see now, the, the path is getting very narrow. The narrow path is the path of a repentant heart, a path of bearing good fruits, the will to change. God wills to change you. He's putting every, any, every effort in it, he can. He might even will you to will to change. True acceptance of him always results in a changed life. We will recognize a changed life by what? The fruits, right? James told us in the Bible, or to use the Bible as a mirror to examine ourselves and then do act upon whatever we discover. Let me read quickly here from James 1, starting from 21. Rid yourself of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. In humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls, but prove yourself doers of the word and not just be hearers who deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer, of the word, another doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has continued in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an active doer, this person will be blessed in what he does. That's the wise man. There's also the way of the foolish. And we can read this in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 22. For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who command themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. In simple words, Paul here warns us that we are not to compare ourselves with other believers. We compare ourselves straight to the truth of God's word. Where we so all in all, it's the path where the Lord cleans us and purifies us. The narrow path is also the path of the cheerful giver. The one who understands whom he received from and to whom he is giving. For him it's easy to give cheerfully. It can be your time in serving, monetary help to your church or a brother or sister in need, helping or ministering to a brother or sister. <clears throat> in many ways we can give ourselves to serve the Lord. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. When you are about to give or do things for others and you are in a grumbling mood, first take some time to make your heart right. Think how he, through suffering, through suffering without grumbling, took the death penalty 
that we deserved on his shoulders. The narrow part is the part that had travelers before us walking on it, from whom we can learn. James 5, starting from verse 10, it says, As an example, brothers and sisters, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. <clears throat> As I mentioned it last time when I was here in the summer, Job said in the end of the book, I think it's in Job 42, 42 I, I have heard of you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I retract, and I repent, sitting on dust and ashes, but now my eyes see you, Job said. The purpose of God dealing with us through hardships is to draw us near to him, so he can reveal himself more and more. Job humbled himself, repented, and all of a sudden, those dark clouds disappeared, and the bright sunlight started to shine again on Job's life. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Paul said, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. So, ah, uh, <clears throat> what's going on here? Imitating Paul? Not me. Don't imitate me. <laughs> Not God. Are we now called to follow men? But Ephesians 4 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Okay. The therefore here, what is the therefore? Turn back one page to chapter 3, which also starts with therefore, and then in the middle it has another therefore, but we have only 45 minutes, so let me get this short. In the last verses of chapter 4, uh, <clears throat> 17, until the end, he states how Christians should behave and walk. Paul is just simply saying this, look at me, how I live my life, this is the life that any Christian should live. Our pastors are instructed to do so, to set themselves as an example for the flock, for the very same reason. 1 Timothy 3 says, An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, self-control, respectable, hospitable, skillful in teaching, not overindulging in wine, not a bully, but gentle, not contentious, free from the love of money. He must be the one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. We can learn so much of others. The narrow part is also a part of humility. And we could easily fill a few Sundays about this topic, so I will not go into it too deeply. But very shortly, for us Christians, it's very easy to become proud. It's very easy to think that we are better than those in the world who are unsaved. Yet, the truth is, we are as worthy of being destroyed in the lake of fire as they are. We never did anything by ourselves to earn God's grace. We can only receive it as a gift to his son. The only difference between them and, and us is that it's what God did for us while we were still sinners. It's a free gift of grace. We can never become more humble than submitting every area of our lives to Christ, to admit in your heart that he is your all in all, and you have nothing, and you are nothing without him. He is your savior, your redeemer, your strength, your joys, and the list is long. The narrow part is the part of brotherly love, and I really love this one. 
Proverbs 17, verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. I like the way the New Living Translation translates this. A friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in time of need. And what an amazing provision of the Lord. God works through people. He also wants to work through you. There's always someone around to help in times of need, whether it is for comforting, encouraging, physical help, monetary help, you name it. I love the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. I think many of you know, know it. And uh, written by John Bunyan, and it, it just pictures this brother you love so well there at some point. And I read the, the old English translation of it with a dictionary in one hand, because every other word for me was like Hebrew. <laughs> but anyway, um, we see the main character, Christian, there. He loses one friend, he gets another one, hopeful. And the one thing that we notice there when we read the story to the end, both of them, on their own, probably wouldn't have made it. God gave always, we read reading the Bible also, Moses, he gave Aaron. You know, uh, Paul, he gave Barnabas. And... Uh, God always provide a friend, a good brother, to keep us on the right path. And if we look at Christian in the book, when hopeful, his companion for the last kilometers of the of the of the way was falling asleep, Christian woke him up. When they went through the, through the river, Christian didn't have enough faith, but Hopeful had, and Hopeful pulled him up, if I remember the story right. So, yeah, it's very important that we have, and God will provide in our lives someone uh, in, in our lives for that purpose, yeah, to help us stay focused and, and uh, reach our goal. Um, sometimes you might be in a position to help a brother or sister with someone and you're tired, you don't want to and you think, ah well not, and then what you will see is that another brother or sister will take your place, and you have freedom in this, whether to obey or whether to, to take these opportunities but yeah, somehow it's an awful ceiling. I have experienced this a few times, and you miss the chance to do something good to someone. And, yeah. Uh, Romans 12, verse 10 says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another. First John 4, 20 says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, He's a liar, for the one who does not love his brother, whom he has not seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this command that we have from him, that the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Sometimes I bump into a brother and sister who still believe that God exists to punish them. And they need encouragement. I remember this feeling when I started my walk with the Lord and reading first through the Bible, I turned every other page with trembling hands, uh, reading through it. And we have this feeling, you know, this conviction that we can when we get when we start reading the Bible. We need it so we get convicted of our life. Uh, sinful life so we can uh, bring it in front of the Lord anyway God will punish he will punish them who are mentioned there in Revelation 21 verse 8 
We are those of Revelation 22, verse 14, the ones who wash their robes by the precious blood of Christ that remove all those stains. And that is his heart. His heart is like this. John 3, verse 17 says, God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. His heart is not to judge you, if you still believe that. His heart is to save you. Why would he send his son, who gladly laid down his life for you, if he wants to send you to hell? It makes no sense. He can destroy you this very second. Look what happened in Acts 5 with Ananias and Shapira. 1 Timothy 2 says, God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. This is the heart of God. It gives him pleasure to save us. How strange it must sound. The narrow part is also a part of adoption. Ephesians 5, verses 1, uh, Ephesians 1, verse 5, sorry. In love he predestined us to adoption as son and daughters to Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus Christ, the narrow gate to himself, according to the good pleasures of his will. We don't have time to go into that any further. The narrow path is the path of gaining wisdom. How do we gain wisdom? By seeking, studying his word, praying, and asking for it continuously. It is freely provided to all of us. From Ephesians 1, this wonderful chapter, I don't have the time to quote it all, I start from verse 16. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom. I switch to James 1, verse 5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James 4, verse 3, You ask and do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, so that you must pay it on your pleasures. Switching back to Ephesians 1. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Make, of his calling, make sure of his calling. What are the riches of the glory in his inheritance in the saints? Um, there's another way to gain wisdom, as the Lord is very resourceful. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm, says the proverb. When we seek wisdom, the Lord is always faithful. He is rewarding. He will put wise brothers on your path to minister to you. But 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 says, Do not be mismatched with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and lawlessness share together? Or what does light have in common with darkness? Or what harmony does Christ have with, with Belial? Or what does a believer share with an unbeliever? Or what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as he said. Sometimes 
It's better to let go if you have unbelieving friends as they will continuously try to pull you in the opposite direction. You can still pray for them. But you are now a new creation. You are not longer can participate in the things of the world, worldly minded. Uh, he said, I will dwell among them and walk among them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out of their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. The narrow path is also a part of contentment of rather being content with whatever God provides for you. He promised he will provide for all your needs, not all you want, but all your needs. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, says Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let's look at some of the warnings here. In Timothy 6, Paul tells us about godliness becoming a means of great gain accompanied by contentment. Wow, great gain. Let's hear. We have brought nothing into the world, so we can take nothing out of it either. If we have food and covering, with this we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. And many foolish and harmful desires will plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money, the love of money, is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It's sad to say in my life, I know people like this. I have seen this happen to people. Verse 11, but flee from these things, you man of God, to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness, the true riches. Hebrews 13, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever abandon you, so that we confidently can say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what will man do with me, to me? No one can serve two masters, either you will hate the one and love the other. When you happen to come from a poor background, a poor country, and all of a sudden, when you arrive here, money has become easy to get. Protect your heart for this. There's nothing wrong with earning money and making a life for yourself, but don't make it your Lord. I have seen this sometimes happen to people who came here from abroad and they were so rich in faith. And then little by little, they stopped showing up at church. They started working two jobs or three jobs and I'm sure the Lord is able to put them back on the path. But yeah, it's a detour. You don't want to take. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and we will give you the desires of your heart. God say he will give us the desires of our hearts. I believe so. Now, when we are content with what we have, and we don't have that large out with the swimming pool, which I wish you all would have. <laughs> uh, even, uh, if we are content with all we have, you are in a position where you are easily pleased and more grateful for the things that you receive. And I only have to look at my wife, <laughs> as I've been so serious now, until now. She got the desires of her heart, she got me. <laughs> and, and I really wonder what she sees in me. 
I can really not imagine that why I would be her desire. But this is what she wanted, this is what she got, praise God for it. The Bible says don't live by your own understanding. <laughs> so I don't even try to understand it. I tell you one, one story quickly without trying to embarrass her because she never liked to be dragged into my, my sharings here. But we were once helping out a, a, a couple in, in getting a, a new bed, which they bought second hand for one euro. And because I have a van, or at least I have two of them, so they called me if I couldn't drive. So we went to the house there and we to pick up the bed. Uh, we got one euro reduction for it. <laughs> it was advertised in the toy. Anyway. There was some packed stuff there ready. I think the couple was moving or were they splitting up? I don't know. And when we were there, they had other stuff still standing there in the house in, in their place. And they said, that, do you also want to have this? Do you also want to have that? Sorry for that. Uh, I hope the equipment is still functioning. <laughs> anyway. They were asking, that, would you also like to have this? Would you have it? Okay, so we loaded up the van. And then my wife, she had seen there near the area where all the pack stuff was, there was this, this uh, white basket with a blue pillar on it. And she was like, with low voice, look at me. <laughs> she was saying to me, that, can you ask if they also want to give that away? And I said, well, you know, it's back there with the stuff. They're going to take it with us, with them. I said, I was shy to ask, you know, they were already giving so much stuff. And again, she said, could you ask, could you ask? And she was like nodding me like with low voice. And I said, no, they are going to taste this. So we loaded the stuff in the van. We closed the door. We were driving away. All of a sudden, this man, he was banging on the window of the passenger side, carrying this white basket with the pillow. And we opened him and he said, would you also like to have this? <laughs> And, and this is how God can use any person to give you the desires of your heart. And I've seen this happen so many times to my wife. And I'm happy I can learn from that, yeah. That's how good he is, yeah. And she was really happy with this, yeah. <clears throat> uh, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, says 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. So, can we say that the narrow path is the part of the poor? Well, <laughs> I don't want to go there. But listen to this. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him. It seems the Bible gives more challenges to the rich than to the poor, to fit through the eye of the needle, for sure. But we don't have time to go into all this today. <laughs> uh, the narrow path is a path of equality. Equal equality, yeah. And uh, the Bible warns us not to be partial. My brothers and sisters, it says, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and is dressed in bright clothes and a, and a poor man in dirty, filthy clothes comes in, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the bright clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. It is called the sin of partiality. And this has everything to do with brotherly love that we are called into. And let you just give me one of my silly examples. <laughs> one of the elders of the church ask you if you have time to help him move his piano Thursday at 4 p.m. Right away you say yes, and next you're on the phone to your hairdresser, and you reschedule your appointment. 
You did nothing wrong. God bless you for it. You're helping your brother. But now say, a poor sister, maybe someone you don't even like so very much, asks you to help her carry down an old bed, down the stairs of her apartment building, Thursday at 4 p.m. She cannot manage by herself. And your answer is, oh, I would love to help, but I got a hairdresser appointment. I'm so sorry, but could you ask someone else? Next time better. There's also nothing wrong in doing that. You had to have an appointment. But can you see where I'm going here that, you know, we should not look at the person, you know. We should have a help heart towards everyone, no matter who. And these things happen. It happens here also. We should examine ourselves also in these things. It is called the sin of partiality. It's not love. Uh, I'm running out of time, but I'm almost done. So let's finish it. The narrow part is the part of seeking God and finding God. Jeremiah 29, 13 promises, And you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. Do not worry then, saying, What we will eat or what we will drink or what we will wear for clothing, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, all these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. How many have neglected or rejected this just be because they thought they would miss out on something? I will see God, but first I will finish my study. Or I want to get settled. I have to see I I have to see God now. If I would see God now, I might never get my house with swimming pool in the garden. I shared this first many times to people. And I got, at that point, a very good response to it. But if I bump into these people later on, they are still changing their dreams. The narrow part is the part of diligence. Diligence means careful and persistent work with a lot of effort. Luke 13, verse 24 says, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter, will not be able. 2 Peter 1, verse 10, 11. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain of this his calling and choosing you. As for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Keep that verse in your mind. Make time in your life for the Lord. Daily time. Give him priority in your daily schedule. The narrow part is also the part of hope. Just quickly, as we went through Revelation 21, sometimes more, sometimes less, I try to prepare my heart when I come to Sunday to church. As we always know where we are, we can read ahead. And I found it so much more, or, or get so much more out of the teachings when I first, teachings, when I first prepare myself, because I've read it, I've thought about it, and then I'm much better able to follow the pastor in his teachings. What happened? One time I was waiting for my wife in the car somewhere, and normally I would get enjoy, annoyed by that. <laughs> but I couldn't use it, and I've gotten, I learned patience. <laughs> so, so I think when I'm sitting here, I take my cell phone, and I read to Revelation 21, as the pastor will continue sharing from that this Sunday. So no time wasted. And I thought, okay, my Bible app, it has this, this uh, uh, voice, and my car has speakers, so I connected the thing, I played it, and I was there sitting, listening to Revelation chapter 1, reading along with it. Okay, my Bible app really loves my car. 
I was driving the next day and I heard some sound and I never have radio on in my car. And I just turned up the volume and I heard Revelation channel. I think, what is this? <laughs> and there's something in my Bible app and my car, it seems to autoplay. So it happened every time when I started on my car, there was Revelation, <laughs> Revelation 31 coming. And listening through it time after time, I got this feeling of hope. I got this feeling of longing, wow. ending up at this this final destination. You know, the the, the revelation. It starts with the new heavens, the new earth, and it, it 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 ends with the new Jerusalem. Yeah, wonderful chapter, giving hope. Uh, the narrow part is a part of forgiveness. The narrow part is the part of serving Him. The narrow path is so full of grace. Last week we heard so much about it. Don't have time for it now. The narrow path is very narrow. So you say, or the narrow path is so narrow that it's easy to recognize. So you say, how come? It is so narrow. How can you recognize it? Well, there are only two choices here. It's the na- either the narrow part or the wide road. And because it is narrow, you will easily recognize it and tell it apart from the wide road. The narrow part is a part that is full with signposts. How is that? Just follow the directions on the sign. This book is so full of them. Read them with your heart, with your understanding. The white road is also signposted in the same book, so you can easily tell them apart. God's plan is bulletproof. When you obey, you cannot miss your end destination. Uh, when we not only read the signs, but also follow the signs, we become doers of the words, followers of Christ, and one thing is sure, only then we will reach the end destination. We, as we abide in him, and he who is faithful abide in us. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, And there are few who find it. Who then can be saved? Good news. With God, all things are possible. One other important thing that we can learn from our text for today, even though it says the gate is small, and it says there are few who find it, I, if I would have written the Bible, I would have written it just in exactly the same way. And why? To make us all the more diligent to seek it. And the very last thing is, the way is narrow that leads to life. It very clearly says, the way leads to life. It will not lead you anywhere else. So thank you for listening to me. And just let pray quickly as we are way over time. Uh, Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are a God that we cannot but love once we come to know you. Lord, help us find your way, this narrow path, leading to life. Protect our hearts to stay firmly on it. Lead us not into temptations. Create in us hearts that diligently seek you for true wisdom. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you signposted it so well, Lord. When you went in front of us, so when we obey you and take up that yoke that you made so light for us, to carry, we cannot mistakenly end up at a wrong destination. 
Lord, we love you. We honor you. We praise you for all you are. In Jesus' name, amen.